I had to make sure it wasn't giving you mine. Children's church can be dismissed at this time. You ever notice how our children, they really get excited about children's church? I wish our adults would get exc- so excited. I, I, I don't mean to uh, thrust you into boredom here today. Uh, a little bit, but something happened last week, and uh, God gave me a message. And it, you know what? In all my years of ministry, I had never taken and paused and taken the time to actually just, I I knew them, I memorized them from being a child, being a pastor's uh, son, PK, which uh, PK means preacher's kid, and uh, being in Sunday school, I memorized my, in my lifetime, I knew what we call the Beatitudes. But uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't necessarily my thought process that I was going to do what I'm getting ready to do now. It's just lay, God laid on my heart um, the, the uh, last week that, that how that we are to become peacemakers while we live in a world of chaos. Uh, families live in a world of chaos. Many of them do. And uh, school systems. Uh, And I don't know if you've been viewing the news, but uh, just such as we had four migrants to illegals to attack these two police officers in New York City. And uh, I was... Uh, up until four o'clock this morning, myself, and I was uh, seeing that that in New York, which has become a sanctuary city, that they are giving migrants fifty-three million dollars in visa cards, a thousand dollars apiece. I thought about becoming a migrant myself. I could sure use the thousand dollars, but uh, so I, I felt the necessity to speak on the subject of how that we as Christians are to become peacemakers, and uh, I will tell you that it was not easy this week. It was not an easy task for me, and on a couple occasions because. I've been tried this week to uh, get back, retaliate, do whatever, and God gave me a wonderful wife, and we've reminded each other all week that uh, remember Sunday morning's message. Now, Sunday morning wasn't the type of message where people jump the pews and run the aisles or anything like that. And I don't judge whether or not that I succeeded in fulfilling God's word by necessarily how people respond emotionally to the word of God. At the end of the day, when I'm finished here and we've said our final amen, everything's been said that needs to be said and we have communion, I go back home and I go and I always assess. Uh, what what I've said and what I've done, but at the end of the day, I uh, I want to know that the Lord is more pleased in what I have said than you are. A couple of Sundays ago, uh, I told Diana I beat myself up because I I'm I'm my worst critic, and uh, I thought that the. And the 40-some years of pastoral work that perhaps that may have been one of the worst sermons I ever preached in my life. So I went home, and uh, I I wanted to make this announcement too. I've forgotten to do so, but I went home, and as you know, we live stream our services. And uh, 
I go back and I, I go over everything that was said and everything was done and things of that nature, and I was really beating myself up because I just felt like I hadn't delivered. Well, there's a friend of mine uh, that lives uh, way down in Florida. My dad uh, was his pastor. I knew him since I was a teenager. Uh, my dad married him and his wife. And you have a place on there where people can comment. And when I read that comment, it told me everything I needed to know. Where I felt like it was a dud, he said, I really needed to hear this today. This was for me. So whatever I do speak, I want to speak to encourage and to lift up. And But God spoke to my heart. Jesus gathered his disciples together. And he was basically beginning his ministry. And as he was beginning his ministry, and, and he was telling his people, his disciples, these are the things you need to be careful that you accomplish. So the Lord laid on my heart that we are going to just do a study on what we call the Beatitudes. And today, let's go ahead and go to our text if we can. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3. Lord, we love you today. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. We pray, Lord, that you would just uh, bring us into unity. Lord, as we go to this place right now, Lord, that you feed us fresh manna, a fresh word from the Lord here today. We want to hear a word from you that will help us in our endeavor to be more like you. We want to hear a fresh word from you, Lord. So open our minds, open our spirits, anoint me to preach and to teach, and Lord, anoint the people to hear and to listen a living word that could change our lives. We're desperate for you, Lord. We're desperate for you. We need you. In a world of chaos, Lord, we need to hear from you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we bring that scripture up, Travis, please? In, in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3, the Lord talked to his disciples and he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So what I want to talk to you today about is a promise for the poor in spirit. One day, the father of a very wealthy family took his son on a trip to the country with the express purpose of showing him how poor people live. They spent a couple of days and nights on the farm of what would be considered a very poor family. On their return from their trip, the father asked his son, how was the trip? It was great, Dad. Did you see how poor people live, the, far, the father asked? Oh, yeah, said the son. So tell me, what did you learn from the trip? The father asked. The son answered, I saw that we have one dog, and they had four. We have a pool that reaches to the middle of our garden, and they have a creek that has no end. We have imported lanterns in our garden, and they have the stars at night. Our patio reaches to the front yard, and they have the whole horizon. 
we have a small piece of land to live on, and they have fields that go beyond our sight. We have servants who serve us, but they serve others. We buy our food, but they grow theirs. We have walls all around our property to protect us. They have friends to protect them. The father was speechless. Then his son added, Dad, I would like to thank you for showing me how poor we are. Isn't perspective a wonderful thing? At first glance, Jesus, his reference to the poor in spirit seems to refer to those that have little or no money. Uh, I didn't bring my wallet with me today. But man, I'm, I don't... I, I'm living, I'm doing well in the cashless society. I've got money in my pocket uh, a, a, from time to time, but pretty much so I don't have any cash in my pocket. But now in my wallet, I have $24. Isn't that amazing? Before debit cards existed at times in my life, I didn't have any money. At times in my life, I uh, had over $1,000, $100 bills, wrapped up, folded up, stuck in my pocket. But uh, Jesus is not referring to money. It's not a curse for a person to be poor and not have any money. And it's not necessarily a blessing for those that have money to say that they're rich or whatever. Because I've seen rich people that were arrogant, and I've seen poor people that were arrogant. I've seen rich people that were unhappy, I've seen rich people that were happy. And likewise, I've seen poor. But we would think that it seems to refer to those who have little or no money. People with zero financial security. Blessed are those that are poor in spirit. Isn't that what it would seem to imply? Wrong. You'll know that he speaks of being poor in spirit. Matthew chapter 5, <coughs> verse 3. This is an attitude of abs absolute, unvarnished humility. What an excellent way to describe the portrait of God's servant. In Philippians chapter 2, it tells us, that Christ himself, being equal with God, thought it not being robbery to be equal with God, but he took on a reputation and became a servant. A servant that would come to man and wrap himself in flesh and become one of us. A servant to the beggar. A servant to the blind man. A servant to those that were dumb. A servant to the demon possessed. A servant to a woman at a well. A servant to blind Bartimaeus. A servant even to his disciples. And even a servant to the one that was going to betray him, Judas that he took upon himself a servant. I don't know the full tilt of how they, and what their towels and the linen, how it was designed. Uh, but uh, I do know that in that evening where we had uh, one of the things that kind of 
got me going in this direction was our uh, Bible study last Wednesday night when God spoke to me. Brian and Cindy have been doing a, a study on the feast, and I, I encourage you to watch that and, or come out and be with us. And uh, it's, it's a tremendous study. But even if you can't study it, we're, we're showing it online, and uh, people can view it online. But it's talking about, you know, the, the lump in the bread and, and the unleavened bread. And uh, how one, one bit of leaven, uh, yeast, it, it can spoil the whole mess. And uh, Jesus himself taught us servanthood. And one day he took his disciples and whatever, how that towel was manufactured or made, he took that and he dipped, had that, uh, that last cup of wine with his disciples. And then he said, one more thing, guys. He said, I don't want to wash your feet. It's kind of like today's society is that if I were to look at you, let me tell you about washing feet what it was in that society back then. <coughs> Nobody, uh, we even used to have feet washing services in church. And I, you know what? Looking back, I, I uh, in my lifetime, I've never ever once attended a foot washing service where I wasn't blessed. I mean, it was, it's just something about it. We don't do that very often anymore or don't really do it at all anymore. But if I were to say to you, hey, I want to polish your shoes, that would be like one of the things uh, that back then feet washing would be, is that we say, people made com comments before, is that I don't want to be a shoe shine boy. When you make comments like that, basically what you're saying is I don't want to be a servant. I'm not going to, I'm not going to serve anybody. But it's my calling in life to serve you, it's your calling in life to serve me. It's your calling in life to serve others. If you're a husband, you have a wife, it's your calling in life to serve each other. That the husband, not just the husband's over the wife, no. You serve together. It's your calling to serve your children. And it's the children's calling to serve you. But none of us really like to take on that position. Servanthood. Servanthood. And I think that one of the things is that there's that little element of pride. That lump in the leaven. It's called pride. Instead of humility. What an excellent way to describe the portrait of God's servant. It is the portrait of one who sees himself or herself as absolutely, and this is what Jesus was trying to tell his disciples. Now, I'm telling you right now, I'm not a rich man. By any means, my fine... <coughs> Excuse me. I've told people before, I'm so broke I can't pay attention. So it's not in my materialistic value, how much money I own. None of that stuff matters. And this is not what Jesus is talking about. But you have to see yourself today. And when Jesus says, blessed are those that are poor in spirit, is that when you realize that without Christ, you are spiritually bankrupt. You have nothing without Christ whatsoever. The car belongs to Christ. Everything belongs to Christ. Your bank account belongs to Christ. But there, we, every one of us, when we realize that we are spiritually bankrupt, deserving of nothing, 
the, the attitude of uh, a lot of people is that I want more. And, and, and there's never enough is that I remember I was 16 years old. And there's a place called Shakey's Pizza. I don't, any, did everybody ever hear of Shakey's Pizza? Well, they were one of the first ones that came out with a buffet. I remember when you went to a Chinese restaurant, there, none of them were buffets. You had to order, and they would place a little thing there if you want to order family, and they would give you like four or five different entrees, and you would turn it what, like a Lazy Susan type thing. People would share and do all that. There were no buffets. You can't go any place nowadays where they don't offer you something all you can eat. You go to Olive Garden, guess what? You go there for the spaghetti, but behind the spaghetti's there, you already have four bowls of salad because it's all you can eat salad. It's included in the price. Go to Red Lobster, and it's all you can eat garlic biscuits. I was at Shakey's Pizza with a couple of buddies of mine, and they had for $3.95 all you can eat, chicken, pizza, and salad. And 16-year-old boys in high school, we were there eating. Finally, the manager of the restaurant came over and said, you guys have to leave. $3.95, I think, was or $3.99. And so we tried to argue the fact, hey, it says oh, you, know, you can eat for three ninety five. He said, That's exactly right. That's all you guys can eat for three ninety five. Out of here. But we live in a society that regardless of how much you get, people want more. I want more. I need more. And somehow or another that is that is transmitted, and that is taught to our children. But the spirit of humility is very rare in our day of strong-willed, proud, peacock attitudes. We like to spread our feathers. The clenched fist has replaced the bowed head. Give it to me. I want it now. The big mouth and the surly snare, stare now dominate the scene once occupied by the quiet godliness of the poor in spirit. Humility. How self-righteous we have become. How confident in ourselves we have become. We can do it by ourselves. We don't need anybody's help. And with that attitude, how desperately and unhappy we become. If we are willing to work together, uh, I'm not going to, Diana, bless her heart, she's the greatest wife in the world. That's the reason why I've been married to her for 48 years. But she has a tendency that if I'm doing a project, she'll say, here, here, let me look at it, let me look at it, look at it. And what I'm trying to tell her, bless her heart, is that you're just getting in the way, babe. I've got this figured out, but... But sometimes we take this attitude, we can do it all by ourselves. When we realize that, that in reality, that we are a team. I've used this analogy before, but I'll use it again. The difference between a spider and a bee is this, is that a spider is a very solitary creature. And a spider, they depend on, they, they, they build their web, and you know, that is their area they don't want any other insect, anybody in there. As a matter of fact, the reason why they build that is to trap any type of prey. That's their territory. They're solitary creatures. But then there is the bee. The difference between the spider and the bee, the bee, uh, the, the, the spider doesn't want anybody around. They're, they don't move and in, 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 in operate with colonies. But the bee thrives off of what the other bee is doing. And they are a colony. And they depend on each other. It's a natural reaction. And if Christians could just become like that, is that we, we take the attitude that we can do this by ourselves. We need each other. And for sure, we can't do and we can't operate this 
at a church by herself. D.L. Queener, we've mentioned him many times in Bible studies. D.L. Queener was a great man of God. But he, you, you think I've said things that would make your jaw drop? He was in a general assembly with 20,000 people. And he said, he said these words, he was preaching. And he said, you know, if the Lord came back today, there would still be enough here to have a pretty good assembly. Sometimes we go, we can do this. I mean, we can have church. We, we, we've got musicians. We have musicians. We can sing. We can, somebody can speak. Somebody can talk. We can go through a religious service, you know, really without any help from anybody. And sometimes, if we're not careful, that that mentality will come over into our that mentality will come over into our attitude to where we don't even need the Lord. We can do this. How self righteous we become, confident in ourselves, and with that attitude, how desperately unhappy we become. A special promise follows the trait of spiritual helplessness. For there is the kingdom of heaven. So if you want to find, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's what Jesus said. The vital condition of receiving a part of the kingdom of heaven is that we acknowledge that we are in spiritual poverty. Can't do this by myself. The person with a servant's heart, not unlike a child, a little child, they're trusting completely in his or her parents' provision. And that's what's promised to us in the kingdom of heaven. For in God's kingdom, theirs is the kingdom. I can't attain this by myself. I can't get to heaven by myself. There, is, there are no deeds that I can do that give me God's absolute favor. Somebody said, man, if I hit the lottery, <laughs> told, I was talking to uh, somebody the other day, I said, you know, if I had this amount of money that I, I hit the lottery, uh, this is what I'd do. I said, but there's only one problem. I won't hit the lottery because I don't play the lottery. But if I came into this, this great people take, if I had this amount of money, I would do this and I would do that. Probably you wouldn't. You probably wouldn't do any more than what you're doing now, percentage-wise, than what you're doing right now. But let's say if I make all these promises and I, I, I'm getting ready to do something, a spiritual thing, and, and it's, it's, there, there's a combination of spiritual and physical uh, uh, a reason why that I'm getting ready but to go on an, uh, another fast, liquid fast, for 21 days, and, and I'm not going to eat any solid foods. I'm doing it for several reasons, okay? And, and some of those reasons are, are this. There are some things that I want to get rid of out of my life, and, and, uh, and there are certain things I want God to do here. There are certain things that I want God to accomplish in my life because sometimes... The leaven can get into the preacher's life, too. But I've come to the conclusion, and this is the whole reasoning behind it, is that there are some things in my life that are, that are just absolutely, they, it, without a doubt, they're just too big for me to handle by myself. So I stand as a spiritual person in spiritual poverty. 
Without God, I can do nothing. I can't, there's, there's no amount of money that, that I could actually, if God gave me more money, and I gave him more money, it wouldn't make, it wouldn't, it wouldn't change my circumstance. I'm still in need of a Savior. I told you here last week, I think it was, or a couple weeks ago, that <coughs> God woke me up in the middle of the night, and uh, and I'm going to ask you, the church, to pray for him, a friend of mine, uh, and told me to send him a thousand dollars. And I mean, really, a thousand dollars to Diana and me probably be like a lot. But do you think that when I did that, that all of a sudden I went to the bank account the next day, and all of a sudden there was $2,000? Because that's the way the name it, claim it philosophy goes around. You buy your way into it. The more you give, the more you do, the more you attend church. Let's say, for instance, all of a sudden we said, okay, we're going to get more spiritual here at Six Point. Instead of having church on Sunday morning, Sunday school, we're going to have it on Sunday morning, Sunday night. We used to do stuff like that, didn't we? And we have it Wednesday night, or we have it Tuesday and Thursday night. And we, and we crammed all of this stuff into our schedule. And we had so much church. Uh, uh, and so we had so many church services. So let's say for the next couple of weeks, what we're going to do, or the next couple of years, we're going, we're going to do is we're going to increase the amount of activity. We're going to have more youth activity. We're going to have more of this. We're going to do more of that. We're going to have more church services. Let's do youth services on Tuesday night. Let's have Bible study on Thursday night. Let's have prayer meeting on Saturday night. Let's do this. Let's do that. And I'm not saying that these things are not important, but what I'm saying, our bu- the busier our schedule is, does not, is not a contingency with God as to how spiritual we become. We can't do more. Somebody says, Okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to quit doing this, and I'm going to quit doing that, and I'm going to start doing this, and I'm going to start doing that. And, and then, I, I want to share this with you right now. You have to realize that you're in spiritual poverty. There's nothing that you can do today and decide to do. And I want you to listen to this very carefully. There's nothing that you can decide to do today that's going to make God love you anymore than what he already does. You can do a lot of good things that merit his favor, but he's never going to love you more than what he does right now. He loved the whole world so much that he gave his only begotten son The opposite attitude is clearly revealed in the Laodicean church, and we're going to close here. If you would, I'd like for you to go with me to Revelation chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. Now, the Lord is speaking here, okay? And he says, He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write these things, saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot, For then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And know not that you are wretched and you are miserable. And you're poor. 
and you're blind. What's he saying to the church that left? Chances were that in that particular church that there was not one single servant. First and foremost in the life of an authentic servant of God is a deep abiding dependency on the living Lord. On that basis of that attitude, O wretched man that I am. Remember when Paul said that? In chapter 7 of Romans. And he said, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the bondage of this death that I'm carrying around in me? Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, I believe it is. Who, who's who's going to deliver me? He was admitting his poverty. That this thing's too big for me. I can't handle this by myself. So who shall deliver me from the bondage of this death? Chapter 8, verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Those who walk not after the flesh, walk not after the flesh, spiritual poverty, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So on this basic beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit. And we're going to go through all of these eventually. So I ask you today, if you stand with me, please. First and foremost in the life of an authentic servant of God is a deep, Abiding dependency on the Lord. For you to have eternal life, you have to accept the fact that Jesus Christ died for your sins. And that's how you can have eternal life. You can't buy it. You can't sell indulgences. You have to come to a place to where you realize... I'm poor in spirit. And I need a Savior. And that Savior needs to be Jesus Christ. And you say, Lord, I am so glad you're here today. But coming to church doesn't save you. It takes a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask you today, Do you know Christ as your Savior? Have you accepted Him into your heart, into your life? Have you come to the conclusion, <coughs> excuse me, that you can't do it by yourself, that you need Jesus, you need a Savior? If there's a person here today that does know Christ as your Savior, but you would like to accept Him into your heart and your life, I want to pray with you today. We're not going to embarrass you. We're not going to do anything weird, anything like that. We're just going to help lead you to Christ. And I'll tell you how simple it is. You have to realize that you need Him. And you say a simple prayer such as, Jesus, I believe that you died for my sin. I could not redeem myself, but you came to redeem me. 
And I ask for you to forgive me of my sin. To come into my heart and come into my life. And Jesus, I now gladly receive you as the Lord of my life. If that, if you say that prayer and accept it, it's very simple. At that moment, Peter spoke to the church and he said, Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if you've never prayed that prayer, or maybe you've drifted and you want to recommit yourself to the Lord, why don't you just slip up your hand? By seeing no hands, I'm assuming that uh, either everyone in this building knows Christ or else it's not your wish, it's your desire. And I'm going to pray that you do eventually. In the name of Jesus, would you grab someone by the hand? And just uh, say these words with me today. Jesus, I can't do it by myself. I need you. I admit that without you, spiritually, I'm impoverished. And Lord, I want to see the kingdom of heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Mr. Karen, would you come, please?